Good morning, everyone. Uh, 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 an introduction that kind of danced around uh, the reality, uh, saying that I bring up controversial issues. Uh, I'm one of the token crazy faculty at UT. That's the easiest way to say it. You know, every university needs its faculty who stir things up. But I, I have been willing to critique power, take on difficult issues, uh, including the most powerful and difficult issue, which is the University of Texas football team, of course. So uh, <laughs> the fact that I'm still here is quite an amazing feat. Uh, I'm going to do something that professors almost never do, which is be brief and say little, because we have a couple of very experienced reporters up here. So uh, Lauren Steffi from the Houston Chronicle uh, will kick us off before Greg, and then what we'll do is open it up to questions and comments, and if there's a need at the end, I'll offer some reflections on how to perhaps understand the media as a business. Maybe just to introduce, uh, I think it's always important to distinguish between journalists and journalism. Uh, I'm a former journalist and I now teach in a journalism school and I say this very, very, uh, with a lot of affection. Some of my best friends are journalists. Uh, I was a journalist and I know that there are many journalists in the United States today as well as around the world who are principled, uh, experienced, hardworking and committed to the, the mission of journalism in its you know, most principled form, which is, of course, to monitor the centers of power and provide people with the information they need to actually function as, as citizens. And we've got, I think, two examples of that. But let's not mistake journalists with journalism, which is a business. Uh, we often refer not to journalism, but the media. Uh, and we recognize that the media is an institution which functions in a particular system and responds to particular kinds of pressures. Uh, and so what I think we're going to do today is see what good journalists can do and also then try to come to terms with what journalism, journalism sometimes impedes those journalists from doing. So to kick us off, Lauren Steffi. Well, thank you. Um, I think it's very interesting that, that we're starting this panel following Robert's presentation, and, and Robert, I've been a, a fan of your blog for quite a while, so. Uh, uh, but if, if you look at what he's talking about there, uh, with, with the, especially with issues related to politics, to how people relate to energy, um, what, that's not a, it's not a real positive message, and it's not a real simple message. Um, and so really when you look at the media's role in, in covering energy issues, it, it starts with the relationship with readers. Um, readers don't like a lot of complexity, they like simple answers. And as we have become a more electronically driven uh, information dependent society, they like those answers to be shorter and simpler and if possible entertaining. Uh, which doesn't really lend itself to an in-depth discussion of, of global oil production. Um, I mean, maybe for you guys, but, but for the general audience, it really doesn't happen. And so one of the frustrations as a journalist is, is how do you get people to, to really care about this? Um, and, and as a writer, I tend to look at things in terms of narratives, in terms of traditional ideas of storytelling. And uh, just to give you an example, I stumbled across recently, well, a year ago, um, some, some things that uh, I found interesting. It was coming out of Congress in the 1920s, and they were debating the future of oil and the rise of uh, basically what we would now call ethanol, whether ethanol should play a future, whether Congress should mandate it. Uh, and there were these intense political battles in the 20s, and one of the beliefs was that we were going to run out of oil in 20 years, and we had to do something about it. And so they were trying to come up with a political solution. Henry Ford wanted to use ethanol, and John Rockefeller, of course, didn't want the farm lobby involved in, in energy production. And so what, it, what, it, what wound up happening was this very nasty, very bitter battle between these two really powerful guys and, and Congress and all this stuff. And it ultimately came down to a debate about uh, using lead in gasoline and the safety of that. And, what struck me was how incredibly parallel some of these discussions were to the current debates that are going on in Congress. And so I started kind of kicking around the idea of doing this as a book. And what I found was that there really weren't any publishers, any commercial publishers, that were interested in that story. Oh, it's ancient history. Nobody cares. 
And the more I started exploring this issue and trying to bring it into the modern day and make it, make it relevant, um, that didn't really seem to matter either. Um, and so what, and what, I, what I took away from these discussions with publishers is, you know, the public really doesn't want to, you're not gonna have a big selling book uh, if you're writing about energy issues because people don't care. And I think it gets back to what Robert's talking about. Most Americans are very divorced from the cost of their energy usage and you know, sort of the, the how does it get there. They don't understand the complexity behind turning on a light switch and having the lights come on or, or starting your engine and, and having your car run. So what challenge does that present for us in the media? Um, I should say that, that I am very fortunate because uh, working in Houston, Texas, energy is, is obviously the biggest industry in town. And so the Houston Chronicle has a staff of, I believe we're now up to five energy reporters. Uh, we have a designated energy editor and we have an entire section of our, of our website, uh, a, a, an entire separate uh, blog called Fuel Fix, uh, where we collect, uh, uh, aggregate, uh, not just our own energy news, but, but a lot of other people's as well. Uh, you don't see many papers making that big of a commitment to, to energy coverage. Um, you don't see that many papers making that big a commitment to, to much of any kind of coverage these days. Um, one of the challenges we face is that the, the economics of the media business have gotten much more difficult. Um, it is much harder to make money in this business than it used to be. And, and so as a result, we all are trying to deal with fewer and fewer resources. So when Robert's talking about you know, the, the political lag and trying to understand this lag between, between any political action and, and, and reality, for example, um, you know, this became a very heated uh, d debate in, in the recent presidential election, you know, energy independence versus you know, the green dream kind of thing. And, and what happens as reporters is you, you simply don't have the time. You're on to the next assignment. And I see this happening all the time. Oh yeah, I meant to follow up on that, but I didn't get the chance because I walked in the next day and my editor said, well, I have to do this, this other thing. Um, you, you know, I mean, we don't cover, most of us don't have the luxury of covering just one thing, just energy, for example. And, and so it makes it very, very difficult to delve into these incredibly complicated stories and when you don't have readers that are demanding it, um, there's not a lot of incentive there to, to devote the time to it. So I think you know, the, the process of public education is an ongoing one, uh, but what tends to happen is these things get a lot of attention when there's a crisis. So you know, there's been a lot of interest in the last few weeks, for example, we've had renewed interest in the Deepwater Horizon and what went on there because we've had the criminal settlement with BP. And we're trying to figure out, do we have a framework in place now that will create better, a better safety environment for offshore drilling? Um, I've spent the last two weeks trying to find out the answer to that question actually and I'm convinced the answer is no because we don't really know what the data is. Um, so one of the myths that we confront in the media, for example, is if you write about an offshore drilling accident, okay, you will get calls from an awful lot of people that have spent their life in the oil business and they will tell you how safe it is. Well, we have this incredible safety record. We've drilled 50,000 wells in the Gulf of Mexico and we have only had one problem like Macondo. Well, first of all, that's not a true statement because you've only drilled about 43 wells that were drilled to the depth that Macondo was. So, it's, it's not even an accurate comparison, but more importantly, the data points on those 50,000 wells, we don't know what the safety problems have been. There is no comprehensive tracking. It's not like there's OSHA data out there on these rigs. And, and, and so we, you don't even have a reference point to, to work from. Um, and, and so that's kind of a, that's, to me, that's an interesting story, but it's also a very technical story, and it's not something that you know, people are screaming for. That's the reason this has been going on for 60 years without greater scrutiny in the Gulf of Mexico. It takes a crisis before it focuses people's attention. And so what I see us doing in the media far too often is lurching from crisis to crisis. Uh, where all of you have an opportunity, I think, is when you see something like the, the IEA report that came out a couple of weeks ago. Now, you know, they put out that report, they summarize it for all of us so we don't have to read the whole thing, and they put out a press release. And of course, the first thing the press release says is that the U.S. production is going to pass that of Saudi Arabia. Well, that's gonna grab the attention of every assignment editor in, in Washington or, or even in Houston, and we're gonna do that story. And we should do that story. And, and that story should be written. But there should be more to the story than just that, okay? Now, I have the advantage of a columnist of coming along behind that reporting 
and saying, well, well wait, wait a second. Uh, let's read further down and see what this is saying. You know, this isn't a real pretty thing. This isn't a very optimistic uh, outlook. But, but there's not enough opportunity to do that. And where I think all of you can, can weigh in is, is by joining that discussion. Um, this organization, for example, can, can reach out to reporters and say, hey, you know, there's another side to this. It's not just, you know, the environmentalists say this and the oil companies say this. There's another, there's a deeper analysis here. One thing I can tell you is that reporters love the contrarian story, and if there's another way of looking at something that hasn't been considered, most reporters will gravitate to that. And I know I've talked to a number of you in this room, and you guys love data and numbers and, and facts, which uh, we do in the media as well. And so I think it's more a, a question of establishing a dialogue and, and getting that other perspective out there, which, uh, you know, quite frankly, takes time. Um, but let me, let me go ahead and stop there, because I think we wanted to allow a lot of time for discussion, and you have some, uh, some visuals, I believe, that you're going to show us. <laughs> go ahead, Craig. Well, first, I, I have to say that you refer to uh, journalism as a business, and those of us working for newspapers have for some time now discovered that uh, we're working for nonprofit corporations. <laughs> uh, Prodded for months by an energy guru, I set out last winter to inform McClatchy's readers of a frightening set of facts. With China's and India's thirst for fuel driving global energy consumption ever higher, proved reserves of oil, natural gas, coal, and even uranium for nuclear power plants wouldn't last long, half a century by my advisor's rough calculation. If he was right, few affordable new reserves and few re affordable new reserves were discovered, chaos would probably begin to set in within 15 to 25 years as energy prices soared and nations launched wars in desperate grabs for combustible resources. Before I finished this supposedly little project, however, weeks would turn to months of reporting, writing, and sparring with editors over what had begun as a seemingly straightforward premise, but had descended into what felt like an endless circle of debate. Given the topic for this panel, I thought I'd offer you a glimpse inside the process so that you can get one perspective on why the US news media's messages aren't exactly matching that of the Peak Oil Association. This is a tough subject. Technical breakthroughs can make the ground beneath you, can make the ground beneath you feel like an oil slick, and many news editors are leery of scary energy stories. As I said earlier, I began with the goal of looking at supplies of all the major energy sources, not just oil. But a quick examination of the data showed that there was a huge weakness to claims that proved reserves were all rapidly diminishing. Figures on proved reserves, as most of you know, are hardly static. Rather than declining as mankind gobbled uh, BTUs by the quadrillions, they were somehow growing proportionately with demand. And, and in some cases faster, even as consumption grew and the peak oil crowd warned that petroleum produ production was near or already past its zenith. A nearly half trillion barrel surge in oil reserves had occurred as oil prices had soared past $100 a barrel. Higher prices spurred more exploration and use of costly, costlier drilling techniques to reach deposits that had previously been considered unrecoverable. Whatever the reason, my plan for a shocking little expose aimed at taking the U.S. Information Administration and perhaps the International Energy Agency to task for downplaying the truth had suddenly gotten a lot more complicated. Being a bullheaded sort, I plowed ahead anyway. I don't have to convince anybody here that fallacies, myths, and misconceptions abound about global energy resources. One of the biggest is how long existing reserves will last. Heck, when I started to fret at cocktail parties about the looming global energy crisis, I was hushed more than once by friends, one of whom confidently assured me that the United States has 300 years of coal. Now, I was discovering that even the US Energy Information Administration's estimate of 126 years of coal reserves was exaggerated, partly because the government refused to figure in a project projected average rate of consumption growth. That reserves, that reserves to current production ratio was the only number in the agency's forecast, even though EIA's acting chief was insisting to me that the agency does consider consumption growth. 
As I tried to assess where the truth lay and how to explain it all to the public, I waded deeper into the data, into how rising prices quickly translate into increased reserves, and into the ways in which energy can be altered from one form to another. What drove me was the belief that for a news reporter, few issues could be more compelling. Along with worsening worldwide water shortages and global warming, which the current consensus is, says is inextricably linked to fossil fuel, cons fuel consumption, what could be more important than a squeeze on the energy resources that drive modern civilization? I spent long hours working with an expert in exponential mathematics to convert proved global energy reserves from barrels, tons, and cubic feet to BTUs. And then we added in EIA's very conservative 1.6% rate of consumption growth in global energy to see how long the energy from all current major fuel sources would last if they could be interchanged without burning any energy. Only one person in our newsroom had the computer programming know-how to attempt an interactive graphic, a computer tech. To my surprise, he and a graphics artist enthusiastically joined the process, but it was slow sledding. Despite my focus on all major non-renewable resources, I knew what most everyone here knows. The most imminent crisis revolves around liquid fuel supplies. <coughs> I'd written about the threat of peaking oil production a few years earlier and was familiar with the urgent calls for mitigation measures to avoid a catastrophe. But oil giant BP's widely quoted annual global energy assessment, its, uh, its petroleum supply estimates, uh, seemed to telegraph the same message as the US EIAs, not to worry. I scoured the writings of Peak Oil Association founder Colin, Colin Campbell and current president Shell Alaclet, and I hooked up with them in calls to Sweden and Ireland. I read Bob Hirsch's book, The Impending World Energy Mess, and interviewed him. And I asked for an interview with the, e the IEA's chief economist, Dr. Faith Biral, and was told almost haughtily first to get in line and then that he wouldn't have a few minutes for an interview in the coming months. I suspect that that was actually maybe years. I also contacted Daniel Jurgen, a peak oil denier, but one who has managed to maintain high credibility in newsrooms across the country while largely aligning his predictions with those of his industry clients. By the way, Dr. Jurgen told me that he likes and respects the leaders of the peak oil movement. As I amassed mounds of information, a new problem emerged. Headlines began to appear in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and elsewhere about a breakthrough in oil drilling technology and shale formations unique to the United States. Hydraulic fracturing or fracking was a game changer, declared Marsha McNutt, chief of the Geological Survey. Industry officials crowed that fracking had opened the gates to drilling for vast deposits of oil and natural gas. A Citigroup study likened North America to the new Middle East also reveling about huge potential from oil and gas wells off the shores of the United States and Brazil. After decades of dependence on Middle East oil, the United States was edging towards self-sufficiency, aided by the passage of new fuel economy standards that would reduce consumption. Rather stunningly, it seemed to me, my story had gotten a lot more difficult and I was really swimming upstream. Being a bullheaded sort, I plowed ahead anyway. I elected to keep my focus on worldwide reserves, not on the giddiness sweeping the US news media. How could the world add one and a half billion people every 15 to 20 years, I wondered, and keep energy production in step with rising demand? How long could oil and gas production keep growing? Even if oil production hadn't peaked, if demand eclipsed supplies, what difference would it make? Prices would soar and economies would tank. And what if the combined energy content of the world's various combustible reserves is far less than people assume, as our previous speaker alluded? When one of BP's own senior economists told me that nearly all of the increase in oil reserves over the previous decade had come from greater recovery from proved oil fields, I felt a tinge of vindication. Incremental gains and in recoveries from existing wells could only delay a crisis, not avoid one. Finally, my editor brought up my stories at the McClatchy Washington Bureau's weekly planning meeting. Shortly after, meeting, after the meeting broke up, as I sat at my desk, an email popped up on my screen. 
It was from another editor, a widely respected curmudgeon, who in my six years in the Bureau had rarely uttered a word in my direction. Consider this, he'd written, attaching a report from Texas's own conservative think tank, the National Center for Policy Analysis. The history of the petroleum industry, NCPA's paper began, is punctuated by periodic claims that the supply will be exhausted, followed by the discovery of new oil fields and the development of technologies for recovering additional supplies. Moments later, up popped another email from my suddenly chatty new friend. Peruse this, it said, pointing me to another reassuring report on the endless supply of oil. I wrote my new guardian angel a note thanking him, but asking where we'd find enough oil to fill an additional 800 million to a billion new vehicles. We're in a race with the clock, I said, and the clock seems to be winning. Very old argument, he replied. Always proven wrong so far. He pointed me to debates dating to the early 70s over warnings from Paul Ehrlich, Matt Simmons' prediction of draining Saudi oil fields, and Daniel Juergen's figures on expanding global supplies. Not in the least, the boom in the United States for the previous five years. I asked whether all these peak oil deniers were being responsible, assuring everyone about plentiful oil supplies as millions of comforted consumers bought gas-guzzling SUVs. This debate is as old as Malthus, he shot back, pointing to Thomas Walt Malthus's warnings in 1798 that overpopulation would force a return to subsistence living. Then the editor sank the dagger with four words. Energy economics always prevails. Our exchanges continued until he gave a last warning. You are arguing the side that's always been proven wrong. Ignore the history at the peril of your credibility. Being a bullheaded sort, <laughs> I plowed ahead anyway. Ultimately, I got my stories published with plenty of protective language at the top about the U.S. oil and gas boom. The stories still included some harsh warnings about the effects of diminishing supplies of affordable oil on economic growth and the sluggish pack of global preparedness for an energy crunch. It's supposed to be the sluggish pace of the global preparedness. We also posted our imperfect but still cutting edge interactive graphic. Uh, I don't know if we got it up there, but I thought some of you might. I'm sorry, it's the switch. Oh, oh well. Well, it's, you can could, you could find it on the McClatchy, McClatchy site and you can play with it. It's not perfect because there are, we tried to do it with sliders where you could actually put, we're gonna use this percentage of the world's oil and this percentage of the world's coal and this percentage of the world's gas at this, and put a formula in in the coming years, and you would see how fast each would deplete. But uh, you have to put the percentages in. If you put the percentages in, you can you can get an idea. It's 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 somewhat flawed. It took months. This tech, techie just worked nonstop. You had pages of code. It was very challenging. My work didn't go viral as I'd hoped, but the stories get, did get some play and they did push back at the happy talk appearing in many newspapers. Most importantly, from my perspective, they laid out for our readers the problem confronting mankind. So if you wonder if it's difficult to get the message that supplies of affordable oil and other energy resources are disappearing, well, I guess I can vouch for that. <laughs> Uh, as I said, we're going to go directly into a conversation here. There are a couple of mics in the audience. Before we do that, though, I want to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, we have two excellent journalists here. Uh, neither one, I think, is involved in setting the policy for their own news organizations or for American journalism in general. Is that correct? That's true. So Very if true. there is a certain kind of frustration with anger at the media as an entity, uh, the two gentlemen up on the stage are not the appropriate targets of it, correct? <laughs> we can talk about how policy is set in media institutions, but again, a lot of the working journalists who are principled, committed, and hardworking are often bumping up against those policies uh, and feel the same frustration that you do. 
Uh, the other thing to remember is that both of these gentlemen work for the print media, which while it is a shrinking part of the news media, uh, is considerably different in some sense than the electronic media, especially television. And that much of the frustration we often feel with the media in general is really a frustration with television, I think. And the, the superficiality uh, that is more common in television, I'm not exempting newspapers from their uh, contribution to the superficial conversation in the culture. But to remember to make these distinctions, I feel a certain allegiance to and affection for these two gentlemen and want to make sure they're protected in some, some way. <laughs> that said, I think focusing on what can be done by people in this room to help those journalists who are trying to do a good job, because the one thing I would say, and then we'll open it up, is to remember that media, news media, journalism, is an institution, and like any other institution, there's a politics to it. By that, I don't mean Democrat versus Republican politics. I mean a politics in the more uh, general sense, that media institutions respond to pressure just like other institutions do. That media don't make independent decisions about what to cover. They're responding to the forces on them. And one of those forces, historically, that have made the media better are popular movements, progressive movements that ask more of the media and create the context for that better reporting. Uh, so we all, even though most of the people in the room don't work for media institutions, remember we all have a role in, in the media in that sense. So with that, we'll open it up. The microphones are circulating and I'll just let the folks with the microphones uh, maneuver to folks in roughly the order that their hands go up. We're gonna try and keep comments and questions brief enough that we can get through everybody in the room. So that's a polite reminder of don't get long-winded. Among uh, the peak oil people, there is much uh, gnashing of teeth about the uh, ignoramuses out in the world who are ignoring the reality of biophysical limits. I don't dispute that, but I think we fail to appreciate a reality we haven't discussed in enough detail. And uh, during your uh, conversation here, your explanations, um, I thought of the words of uh, President Roosevelt, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And over our economic history, it hasn't been the biophysical limits that have whacked us aside of the head. What has hurt, what has led to unemployment and great suffering not only here, but in places like Weimar, Germany, was people getting afraid, we can't afford all this stuff. They buy less stuff, the economy crashes, unemployment skyrockets. And you, the, the fact that you got afraid led to the crisis. Uh, I think that's that's very true. I mean, as a business reporter, one of the things you, you always focus on is, you know, what what are the markets telling you? Um, and I've always said that the markets are, are a reflection of investors' hopes and fears. Um, you know, when the markets are going up, it generally reflects their hope, and when they're going down, it reflects their fears. And so you try to get into why why that is. Um, but I think, you know, we've seen that in, in the past few years. I mean, part of the reason this economy is struggling is because people are afraid. They're afraid that, I mean, it, it's not a problem with existing capital. It's a problem of people that are afraid to use it because of the uncertainty and, and, and whatnot. And so I think that that is a, a very big element of, of energy policy as well. Um, you know, the availability of capital, the, the, the level of uncertainty, what are people going to respond to, and, and what are they afraid of? Um, you know, the fear that we are going to run out of oil is not something that most people, uh, when they get in their cars, think about. That fear is not, is not real to them. Um, and, and so that, that makes this message much more difficult to, to sell. Uh, and, you know, Robert alluded to this in his, in his slides. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of things you worry about when you wake up in the morning. Um, you know, gee, is the gas station going to be out of gas when I get there? Probably not one of them. Well, I'll just add one thing that has really struck me is I don't know how many of you have watched the the, uh, the stock market. When, whenever there's kind of a, a burst of, of hope about the economy or some good economic news, oil prices start going up. You can just see the 
the connection there. And, and for me, that, that strikes fear in my heart when I see that. Because you see, and the second story I did was about the, the, the link between uh, energy supplies and how they are going to restrain economic growth. And here we have the, uh, you know, the presidential candidates uh, and now the president both, both uh, declared that they were gonna grow the economy, but that may not be possible. Well, now with all this US oil boom, maybe they, that, that will be proved wrong for a while, but ultimately that's gonna be a big problem worldwide, I would think. I, just to add, I think the question may be not, are we too afraid, but are we afraid enough? And I think that's really, uh, it's a society that is, if it's incapable of processing the data, what we may need to do is get a lot more afraid. Uh, and also in your question is an underlying uh, ass assertion and assumption that probably is debatable within this room, which is, are capitalist markets actually a rational way to proceed with any of these questions? Uh, and there's a lot of debate about that that's important as well. Uh, maybe we'll just go back from one side of the room to the other. Oh, thanks. Uh, when, you, when you said you had five reporters covering energy plus an editor, the first thing that popped into my mind was, I wonder how many people you have covering sports. I mean, how, how big is your sports section? And, 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 and I say that only because it, it's a cultural issue of what we're talking about. We, you're never going to have more business reporters than sports reporters. It's just uh, it's just the reality of, uh, of I, I honestly don't know how many sports reporters we have because they're kind of in a different part of the office and I don't, I don't get down there very often. But I, I, I would bet you that we have more sports reporters than ever. But, the, but the, the, one of the other things I want to say is your name is Lawrence, which is actually an interesting name because there was a reporter for the New York Times named William Lawrence in World War II who was an, he was a chemist, physicist background. He was recruited by Leslie Groves to work at the Manhattan Project. He had an office at Oak Ridge, and he had top secret access. He was there at all the meetings. He actually rode on the uh, Nagasaki bomber that dropped the bomb. But everything he wrote was top secret. So when they finally declassified the nuclear secrets, William Lawrence, Atomic Bill, essentially set the DNA for the news coverage, uh, in my view, of, for the news coverage of nuclear power for the, up till now. You can still see his DNA in the coverage of, of how you know, people view nuclear power. My, my point is, and comment on this, if you've you got to just keep doing what you need to do and be really, really good at it so when the time comes to be the go-to guy, you know, when, when, you know, when whatever's going to happen happens, you know, when things that can't continue happening, stop happening, and some of those decline curves that we saw yesterday from you know, the likes of Art, Art Berman and David Hughes, when those things really kick in and everybody wakes up one morning and it's just falling off a cliff, you know, your phone's going to ring and you're gonna, it, it's going to be you that's the go-to guy, and in the sense that you know, okay. not just one person but many. I don't know, any reflection or reaction to that? Or? I was just going to say, you know, when you write a column three times a week, you, you can't really give up. You're always looking for stuff to write about. So uh, fortunately, with energy, there's plenty to cover. Uh, I got the microphone. <laughs> so so uh, I, I want to make a, a linkage between education, economy, and journalism. So, you know, you start at the beginning, which is grades one through eight, and everybody knows that the United States is not doing too well, right? Well, wrong. Because if you disaggregate uh, U.S. children uh, in terms of wealth of their parents, uh, the, the school districts which have no food, uh, lunches, 0 to 10 percent, do as well as Denmark, Sweden, or Norway. Uh, the school districts which have less than 25 percent of food stamps or, or, or lunches do as well as, let's say, uh, uh, Germany and some other countries. The US average is exactly on top of uh, Greece, Italy, and Spain, and the re which is up to 50%. The remainder of the US may as well not live in a first world country uh, because these children are doing poorer than most developing countries. So the fact of the matter is that much of our public is not very well educated because of economic means uh, or, or the availability of, of economic means to their parents. 
And so, and this got worse, very much worse, in the last four years because of the other disruptions. Which then leads me to a conclusion that, well, as these children grow beyond eighth grade, then they get even less educated. High schools are a really bad time for our children in the United States. And then the, the universities become sort of high intensity, uh, you know, ICUs that recover some of the patients, but very few of them. And so, so you're dealing with a public which is essentially, essentially unprepared to understand, to comprehend a complex <coughs> message. And in fact, it has been going on for decades and it just got much worse and it will continue to be worse with all the other uh, you know, financial dislocations. So uh, my argument is that the difficulties of journalism and the difficulties of printed press have a lot to do with the public essentially being impoverished both intellectually and materially. And so, and, and I'm, 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 I'm not finding any solutions here. So you cater to the first 15% and that's how much you print. That's why you are non-profits. And so, you know, how... Well, actually, somebody explained it. Yes, well, so, so, so how do you go I guess my, 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 my appeal here to everybody is how do you broaden the message to those who have been left behind and perhaps forever, right? Those who, who just don't participate in any of this intellectual richness that we have here and will never perhaps participate. And that is to me a role of the media. So, comments. You know, the, the, the problem is that you're as a newspaper uh, reporter, for example, you're reaching this, this sort of narrowing audience. And so, you know, what you're talking about is how do you transcend that and reach new audiences, uh, you know, which is what we're trying to do on the web and things like that. But the economics, you know, aren't there. I, I would say, you know, a, a very good illustration of your point is we're here in Austin, Texas. They just had a Formula One race here a few weeks ago. They spent, I don't know, what was it, $400 million of taxpayer money to build this track. At, a, at the time when we're, we're cutting education. Yes. Okay, so I mean, what, what matters more if you're talking about economic development, and one of our Metro columnists actually made this point, you know, what, what is a good investment in economic development? Is it a racetrack that brings something here once a year, or is it investing in our, in our schools that are gonna pay off for many years to come? We've, we've skewed those priorities because of political expediency, and I think you see much the same thing happening um, you know, across the board. The public is very short-term focused. Readers are very interested in what's happening on Dancing with the Stars, and they're not terribly interested on what is happening with peak oil. And I don't know how you compete with that, by the way. And, and the internet has so changed the game for newspapers as we're fighting to hang on to our circulation for print and, and to make this transition uh, to, to online news. Uh, our, our news holes in our newspapers have shrunk. So when I originally drafted those two stories, they were 5,000 words, and when they ran combined, I think they were, they were cut by a third, because my, and I would have argued, and did you know, frequently argue, run the longer version on the internet, let people who want more depth go on the internet, but we really haven't even made that transition. I don't know if the, and I don't understand why editors are not doing that more, because there, there are people, like this audience, who really have a thirst for the information, to find to, you know, places where they can get reliable information. If, if I can just say, you know, one of the things that's coming out here is media, again, don't operate in a vacuum. We're talking about a media system that is part of a larger society with problems that are deeply embedded, as you're pointing out. One of which, if I can just add, is the fact that one of the interesting stories of the 20th century is the development of the most sophisticated propaganda techniques in history and the corporate world putting an incredible amount of money behind that. So journalists are not just fighting against the apathy of the public, they're fighting against a, a propaganda system, marketing, advertising, public relations, into which billions of dollars is poured every year precisely to make sure that people cannot independently come to their own evaluation. It's part of this system, and I think what we're talking about, and I'm glad to see this, is the interconnected nature of problems of education and media and economics in a society defined by mass spectacle, by the UT football stadium and uh, an insane Formula One race at a point where we're dealing with climate change. I mean, 
the insanity about all is sort of right up front, and I think it's it, good to point you know, that out. Back to the point about the number of sports writers versus, versus business journalists, okay? The, the question isn't how many sports writers do we have versus how many business reporters. The question is how many energy reporters do we have versus how many, how many PR people are on the staff of a major oil company, okay? Because the chances are, I, I don't know the number, but it's very likely that BP has more people on its PR staff than we have in, in our business department. They do. Um, you know. Um, my question is somewhat related, but it has also to do with the more highly educated people, as well as everybody. And it's the psychology of denial. And I have heard it said this is true of both climate change and peak oil and overpopulation and everything else, is if people can make the quick connection that if this is true, this means an unacceptable change in my view of the future, an unacceptable change in something else. There is a negative reaction, and the reaction is often emotional and anger. And we are, in my mind, hitting that trigger, and you, with that curmudgeonly editor you mentioned, that may be an example of that, where they grasp at straws that do not withstand logical analysis but they satisfy the emotional need for denial. So, you know, there, there's a chain, I guess, from what I understand of, you know, un this, if true, means something unacceptable. Therefore, I get angry, and I reject it, and I deny it, and I grasp for any covering to justify that. And I was wondering how much you run into that or what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I think that that editor in particular, I, I don't want to read his mind. I mean, he was a widely regarded editor, and um, uh, he, he is not uh, you know, dogmatic on the, on the far right or anything like that. But, but he, uh, he did a lot of editing of, of, of uh, energy copy uh, in our newsroom. And so I think he, he'd seen a lot of Daniel Juergen's uh, uh, pronouncements and uh, you know and Jurgen's very careful he walks a fine line and and he he uh, he may he does hang on to a, a, a level of credibility while taking on uh, the cause that you're all here for so uh, but you know I think I think that editors just don't want to be burned and there is a problem because because one of the things that happens in the field of energy is is that technology changes the, the landscape frequently. And, and here in Austin, there's all kinds of research going on on energy all the time, and, and we're all, always hearing about new uh, ways in which you can, you can get uh, you know, better fuel economy. Now they're talking about turbo, diesel, um, uh, hybrids that are gonna, they're gonna be outdo all the, the, the latest models that have just come out. And so if you're a reporter now, you're in this field, uh, so maybe you better full time. I'm not. I dip in and out, uh, but but it's it's really difficult to make broad uh, a broad case for for something like peak oil when when the when the game changes around. Or the, not the game, but the but the landscape changes so frequently. Uh, I'm aware. And I can't talk about of of some very dramatic. Uh, potential uh, discoveries in, in the field of energy, not so much on liquid fuels. So, you know, it's, it's, you're watching all this and you're, you're collecting all the information, but you can't be a crusader if you're gonna be a reporter. Uh, you've got a little more freedom because you're a columnist. That's you, what columnists are that's for. That's what you get to do. <laughs> but, but I think uh, I've always been a big believer that, that reporters should change beats pretty frequently. And, and one of the reasons is that, that I heard a police reporter once describe years ago how, how you know, covering something like the police beat over a long period of time can become a radicalizing factor. It, it affects your views on how you see things. You get closer and closer to it. And uh, what, what you always want, you know, is, is 
people who are willing to ask questions that maybe somebody in the industry hasn't even thought to ask. And so that outside perspective is valid. It has to be an informed outside perspective, and that's where things get tricky. But, but I think that, that too often, you know, when, when people cover the same thing for too long, they start to assimilate many of the views of the people they cover. And so that's one of the reasons you see um, big papers, for example, the New York Times does this pretty regularly. They'll move people around on beats. Um, and, and you, you kind of want to encourage that as a news organization because you want to keep that fresh perspective. The danger in it, the, the, the other side of it is, of course, then the new people have a much bigger learning curve and, and, and that, that can also lead to problems. So you have, you have that constant balance. The schedule is being adjusted a bit. We are going to go to 1045, but I've been asked to remind you all to keep your comments short because there's a lot of people who want to talk. Uh, next. Forgive me because this is a comment and not a question, but I was uh, really struck by what Lawrence uh, said about his, uh, his mentor who, who uh, called him out and said, uh, you know, pursue this at, your, at the risk of your credibility. Uh, and that reminded me of what uh, Charles Hall said about his uh, graduate students. You know, if you, uh, if you challenge the, uh, the basics of um, economy, you, you know, you're not allowed to proceed to the PhD. And that reminded me of a book I read a long time ago called The uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, which goes into how major paradigm changes are eventually brought into uh, into the scientific fold. So it, it seems to me that this sort of thing happens over and over and over again, and there's a lot known about the, the, this final barrier that, uh, that prevents people from, um, from accepting the new, and it suggests to me that there might be a, um, uh, an alliance uh, with uh, our friends from social sciences or from, uh, or from psychology to really st strategize about how to uh, punch through this final barrier. Okay, Thank any, you. any experiences working with people in academia doing systematic research on any of this? I haven't, I mean, I don't think so. All right, the uselessness of the academy is once again <laughs> real. No. Uh, you, there, there is a lot, I think, of work about how we think. The notion that we are rational actors and we make in decisions based on information uh, was, of course, never a really serious proposition, but there is a fair amount of social science and psychology, neuroscience, that makes it clear that is not how we operate. And therefore, new strategies, new ways to think about narratives, what really motivates people to change, I think is a fruitful place to, to think. Uh, as I see it, there are typically two dimensions of communication in the press. One is facts and the other's opinions. You have the opinion page and you have the fact page. The third dimension that I haven't seen much attention to is what I might call the spiritual dimension, if I could use that term uh, advisedly. Namely, that I see within our whole framework here a moral dilemma, which is that what we're doing right now is we're burning our children's inheritance. And I've seen very little attention either here in our own uh, milieu or in the media about how it is that what we're really doing here worldwide is we're on a mutual race to the bottom, the bottom of the barrel. And I'm just curious if any of you had any uh, thoughts to how we can call upon our moral fabric to repurpose, reposition our outlook on this dwindling resource relative to intergenerational equity. So maybe commenting on how difficult or easy it is to bring in moral and spiritual questions into reporting on this kind of topic. Well, I think you just got your next column, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, obviously as an opinion writer and, and as, uh, with a column, it's, it's much easier to do that uh, because you can, you can bring in elements, you know, personal experience, uh, personal insights, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And I do think that there is a, a moral in underpinning, not just to energy, but to business in general. And it is something that I write about uh, pretty frequently in, in my column. And, and when I write about issues involving, you know, uh, the, 
the energy independence. I mean, I, I've said that I think that, that these are dangerous distractions for the, for the public. It, it gets people focused on the wrong thing. And, um, you know, I'm trying to do what I can to steer attention back where I think it ought to be, but I'm, I'm one voice. So, um, you know, I, but I think that, that this gets back to sort of the traditional role of newspaper editorial pages and whatnot, which um, have changed a lot over the years, but it used to be that an editorial page was the newspaper's vision of, of wh what things ought to be, and, and it was a way for newspapers to kind of set the agenda on these sort of moral issues that, that underlie the, the daily news. Okay. Yeah, I have a, I, I want to mention something that I think is a big hindrance to this peak oil message. And I gave a presentation yesterday. I'm not completely aligned with this group, but I'm not opposed either. I actually think what they're doing is really important for the world. But um, I, I think back to a, a paper that came out in the early 70s called The Limits to Growth. And I think it was totally misquoted. I think it was strip quoted by the media. Um, there are still some of the people around who were part of that organization, they still say they were strip quoted, but any time that I bring up anything about any kind of limit of any resource whatsoever to a lot of people that I know, these are educated people, I don't know how you deal with the people that Tad was talking about, but they'll say, oh, well, just think back to the limits of growth. They were totally dead wrong. And I that is used as a club over the head of anybody that tries to tries to come up with a different message other than there are no limits to anything that humans can do. And I don't know if there's anything the media can do to try <coughs> to beat some of that back, but I think that's part of the problem with this peak oil okay. message is because people say, well, you know, somebody's always saying stuff like this and it never comes okay. true. Maybe this is the, the, the excuse me, sir. You don't have the microphone, please. The question I think that's raised, the question that's raised by that comment is time frame. Uh, if news is increasingly a short-term project, looking back and seeing the time frame in which depletions work out, is that a problem you all run into? Well, for, for, I was going to comment that I actually talked to one of the authors of that paper. Uh, he didn't. He didn't have time for me. But uh, uh, he said he only he had a few projects before he wasn't. His his uh, uh, he's elderly and he, he had a few things he wanted to get accomplished before his time. It was it was gone and this wasn't going to be one of them. But <laughs> but uh, uh, so. But back to your the question is the, the, the short time frame and how do we how do we do this? And um, I think that part of the part of the the big issue here, one of the, that we haven't talked about, is that um, energy is is eating up more and more of the GDPs of the of the countries of the world, and it's it's really starting to drive everything. And the, the public's not very well educated about the the damage that's being done. And yes, short time frames make in, in reporting and short stories. It makes it really difficult to, to embed this into the consciences of, of, of the, you know, the reading public. Um, but uh, I, think, I think this is part of the education process. There are many themes here. It's not just we're running out of oil. There are many big themes about energy and, and the impact of, of scarce or at least finite resources are going to have or is going to have going forward. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I think that that's, um, you know, one of the challenges you face is, is when you're writing for a daily publication, and now, we, you know, most of us are writing really for what we call real-time deadlines. I mean, you know, with the web, you're, you're always trying to get stuff out there, and so there is an emphasis on, on, on doing more things, doing it faster, and it, and it often doesn't allow a, a lot of time for nuance. I know one of the things I constantly struggle with is trying to carve enough time out of my day just to think about what it is that I'm trying to write about because you're under this constant pressure with social media, with the web, with the print deadlines to, to just sort of crank this stuff out. And I think it's, it's important to, to, to analyze these bigger themes and, and try to, to find a way to use them to you know, to, to create some sort of a framework for maybe a series of stories or things like that. But we're, 
we're fighting a, a constantly shrinking resource uh, base, you know, on, on the on the journalism side too, and it makes it it makes it very very difficult. I mean, we have unlimited space on the web. You you could put your unedited story up there, but the fact is that what's going to get the hits on the web is whatever Kim Kardashian's doing this week, and and so you know you you kind of get this readership that doesn't really seem to want to read a 5,000 word story on energy, and, and even if it's there. And, and that's really the challenge that we face, I think. So uh, when you look back at your energy stories that were most popular, that, that were most successful in, in you know, the newspapers, what are the common themes in those articles? And how, how can we incorporate those themes to you know, reach a broader appeal? How can we spin the story of peak oil to reach a broader audience? That's a great question. So we've been talking about how it's not just the facts, it's not just the data, it's the story we're telling. And so what are the, the stories you've found that do resonate with the public, the, the broader themes? Well, I, I have an unfair advantage because I'm in Houston where an awful lot of our readership is in the industry. And so uh, I, I find that, that I do get a, a lot of, um, when, I, when I try to debunk uh, the, the sort of the general political uh, hype that's going around. Uh, generally, I get a lot of traction with that, especially, again, it's Houston, so if I'm, if I'm beating up the Obama administration over green subsidies or, or something like that, uh, that, that resonates. Y you know, when I questioned the whole energy independence uh, myth uh, when, when Mitt Romney put it forward, I got a little more pushback on that. But I also did have a lot of people saying, you know, yeah, this is right. I, I think, you know, this is being overstated. We need to be careful about this, that kind of thing. So I think those big issues are there with readers, but um, it's kind of something you have to return to again and again to, to drive the point home. But again, my audience is not necessarily typical of America at large. I know when I, when I did my book on BP, I found it very, very difficult to educate, you know, starting with my editors in New York, um, you know, what were the issues involved and, and that this wasn't, you know, they wanted to completely market the book to environmentalists. And I said, you know, that's, that's only one component of the readership and we need to think broader than that. And so that's, that's kind of an ongoing challenge, I think, beyond uh, Houston or even Texas where, where people are not necessarily as focused on energy. I haven't written a, a huge number of stories on, on energy, but when I was with the Minneapolis Star Tribune's Washington Bureau in 2000, roughly 2006, I did uh, a peak oil story, a quick project, and I just immersed myself. I, I got to talk with Matt Simmons and, and, and of course, Daniel Jurgen. And, and uh, um, I, the story published on a Sunday, and I was going on vacation, and I called in and checked my voicemail. The box was full took all those messages off. Every day that week, the box was full. I came back to a, a, a pile of emails that I almost never get. And it was clear to me that, you know, despite the fact that we're, we're lamenting that many in the public uh, are uneducated on this subject and not paying attention to it, and it does not help uh, your cause to have uh, the message drill baby drill being, being uh, you know, pounded into people's brains that there's plenty of oil here, we just have to lift the regulations and so forth. Uh, and that's, that's really, I think, one of the biggest obstacles as far as your cause goes, is, is to overcome the, the, the argument that, that there's plenty, plenty of oil, we're just not getting to it. Uh, but uh, I think there is a, a, a really significant um, segment of the population that that really is is in touch with these issues and is deeply worried about what's going to happen and how we how we're using our resources. Uh, it, that became clear to me. It's one of the reasons that I was interested in doing this project. I said to my editor, I've never had more reaction that I can think of anyway on stories, a story than I did on the peak oil story I did in 2006. I did not get as much. Uh, reaction on this, but I got emails from as far away as Australia. Hi, I'm Doug Hansen uh, from San Diego. So a quick observation to support what you're doing. I've operated in three worlds at a fairly deep level, financial services, which I'm an advisor, uh, climate change, which I've been a long time activist dealing with scientists at Scripps Institute, and then this group here, which I esteem very highly. This is a fantastic group of people. And what I notice is there are some surprising gaps of knowledge, which is part of your benefit of what you're doing for society. Um, the folks in the climate change world are woefully unknowledgeable about anything we're talking about here. Now, 
I don't know about your knowledge on climate change, but my experience is it's not talked about much here. It's either rejected or maybe it's just not that considered. Um, in financial services, I don't have a clue about any of it. So that's just an observation that there is a need to bridge the gap beyond what Tad's saying, the uneducated. Among highly educated people, I see a real problem of siloization, and I've seen that a lot. So it's just an observation. The second is, I belong to a group called Citizens Climate Lobby, and I'm throwing this out, and I was insistent on raising my hand, because there's something tangible, I think, that we can do. Because there's a lot of theory, and what we need to do is make a difference. And what Citizens Climate Lobby has done brilliantly is energize people like us to contact the media, write op-eds, write letters to the editor, okay. and we do that on a consistent and organized basis which I will throw out as something that ASPO could and maybe should consider doing. Because okay. the media, if you hear from people, doesn't that make a difference to you? Like, you get letters, you get calls, and you go, oh, people care about this. Okay. Yeah, and it, it, it also helps to find, you know, knowledgeable sources that are willing to talk to us. I mean, I think that's important. But to the, to the siloization of knowledge, I think that's, that's very true. I mean, one of the things the internet has done is fragment our readership, and so people are much more focused only on what they need to know and, and what they're concerned about. And, and so um, it's really kind of changed that I, I don't see sort of the broad intellectual curiosity in, in readership that I used to see when I, when I first started in this business, um, you know, because everybody can focus on what on, only what they're concerned about. And that actually plays to the political overtones. Y you know, when I mentioned earlier, uh, part of the reason I got some pushback when I wrote about energy independence was because obviously Houston is, is a very Republican uh, uh, city or, 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 you know, Texas in general, certainly the oil business. And so, you know, there's this sense of teams now in politics and you've got to either agree with everything the team says or, or disagree with it all. And, and you see that affecting energy policy as well. And what we need is more people that are willing to, to, to delve into those nuances and say, regardless of what party I belong to, this is, this is an issue that we need, to, we need to get into in more detail. I was wondering whether there is a professional association of energy journalists, or you at least have a listserv or discussion group to talk to each other behind the scenes. And I'm sort of assuming here, or hoping, that there's more than just the five at the Houston Chronicle. <laughs> um, so the question is about how journalists communicate with each other and how that might be useful to folks in the room. Yeah, there's, um, I'm not sure that there's a, a group of energy journalists specifically. Um, there, there is a group. Reporters. Yeah, there, there is a group called uh, uh, the Society of Environmental Journalists, which right. deals with a lot of energy issues and, and coverage of energy issues. And then, of course, business reporters in general have, have their own association. Um, in fact, if anything, I, I might argue there's too many overlapping journalism organizations, uh, but, uh, but I don't think there's one specifically dedicated to energy. I'm not aware of one. Uh, thank you all very much. A uh, couple of quick comments and questions. Uh, and also harkening back to something that uh, Robert Rapier said that I would like to challenge. And this is often uh, presented. Uh, we have a seagull full of coated with oil, and, uh, and, and there's often the, the view that, well, this is part of the price we pay. Uh, I don't think we should accept that. Uh, I, I think that, uh, and this uh, relates to the dumbing down and the propaganda that has been uh, mentioned. You know, I don't think we citizens imperfect though we are, should bear uh, equal responsibility and guilt, if you will, as do our corporate uh, leaders. Uh, Lauren Steffi can tell you, you know, we talk about the Macondo oil spill. Think about how we use words, you know. Spill should be used with milk. <laughs> I mean, we spill milk, uh, but we have a devastating, catastrophic oil blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you know, I don't think the choice is oily seagulls, uh, you know, or, uh, or technology. 
Also, I just want to say that Matt Simmons wrote about uh, revisiting the limits to growth. Could the Club of Rome have been right, after all, uh, in uh, the 2000s? And I just want to say that we had a, a reporter here the other day, Wayne Slater, from the Dallas uh, Morning News, who wrote a pretty good story for us. He said, well, I'm not an energy writer. I said, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, uh, maybe we can head toward a, a question or a comment yeah. they can react to. Well, first. Dan Jurgen, you know, uh, who sometimes says he respects us. On the other hand, Peter Jackson and Bob Esser say that we're uh, garbage. Uh, you know, I just want to say that it's a very difficult deal. McClatchy, Houston Chronicle, uh, you know. Uh, in the oil capital of the world has run editorials about peak oil, uh, acknowledging the fact. So I don't know if this is a question other than just a sort of a, a tribute to you guys uh, and uh, uh, a couple of comments on things that have been said and uh, uh, respond as you will. Maybe a, a way to frame that question is what is the greatest impediment within the newsroom you face to telling the truth as you see it, and what's the impediment outside the newsroom that you run into? Well, when I started this project, um, it's funny, my, my editor said, well, it's not gonna be another peak oil story, is it? And, and oh, no, 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 I'm looking at all the resources, all, and that's how we were, I, I began this project, but it became very clear that, that no, you had to gravitate back to peak oil because, uh, or it didn't even have to be peak oil, but just, just oil, uh, of, you know, the availability of oil uh, versus demand in coming years. And I, I think that there was immediately this sort of, well, we're not going to just write the same story over and over and over. And that's one of the biggest problems you have in the media, getting, getting message out about this whole issue of, of global energy resources is that it's the same story over and over. And editors want surprises to, ca to catch people's attention on their, on their uh, uh, front pages or their websites because it's the same story. But the problem is it hasn't been solved. And, and like so many of these intractable problems facing the planet, uh, you have to write the same story. You have to find new ways to do it, uh, but, but you gotta get past the, that, that uh, resistance from editors. We can't just be repetitious. You run into that? Well, I run into it a bit, but as a columnist, I, again, have a little more latitude because the column is, is my opinion and, and the understanding I have with the Chronicle is, is I pick the topics and, and I pick how I want to become a columnist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so it does give me a, a little more advantage. I, I don't have to deal with what I call the fire hydrant effect, which is where you, know, you, have, you have a whole bunch of editors and they all feel like they have to hike their leg on your story as it goes through the process. Uh, I, I get to avoid that now, uh, which is nice. Um, but, but I do think that, that, you know, there is resistance from the outside uh, to a lot of things that we write and, and uh, the mention of, of oiled birds kind of raised that point in my mind. Um, you, you know, one of the things that you hear a lot about with safety is, well, yeah, you know, anytime a, a bird gets, you know, a little oil on it, then it's a big deal in the media and, you know, I, th I think it goes back to the Santa Barbara spill and the Unical uh, chairman saying he couldn't believe that, that that mattered to anybody. But, you know, I think that, that an oil bird is a symbol in a lot of ways, and it's a symbol ultimately of, of safety and what we have come to understand is process safety. And there needs to be more discussion into how we are, how we are monitoring that and what, what sort of goals we want to have for safety. I mean, is, is that oil bird the price we have to pay? Or is there a way to reduce the number of incidents where that happens and hopefully reduce the incidence of the loss of human life? Uh, those are important things and they're things that we need to, we need to resist in the media, the, the pushback that we get from the industry when we start focusing on those things because it, is, it can be very intense. And um, you know, if, if somebody doesn't like something I write, they'll call me. If they don't get satisfaction talking to me, they'll call my editor. Sometimes they call the editorial board, which doesn't even have any control over me, but they, they like to, they're looking for somebody to try to get leverage. And um, you know, I think that that's, that's something, it's our job, it's inherent as journalists to, to fight back against that. And of course, that, that kind of comes with the territory. But there, there is a lot of outside pressure on some of these issues, um, you know, when you write about them. Mm -hmm. Looking around. 
Hello, yes. Shall I let in my book here, Peeking at Peacock, I'm taking a real case for the journalist. And uh, you probably know this guy, uh, Russ Poole, from Austin here, writes for the New York Times. No, no, it was the journalist. He was fed by a press release from Chevron in, uh, in 2006 about the fantastic discovery, the Jack, you know. And uh, you know, the story went all around the world. And uh, it even came to the president's table. And, uh, and uh, Jürgen was uh, saying if this might be the biggest thing that ever happened to the oil industry in, in uh, the United States. If you look back now to the reality, because the field has not been started to be developed. It was not six billion, and it was not 10 billion, as Jürgen said, it's happened to be 0.4 billion. And, and, and again, who is responsible for these kind of things? You know? Because if the company has fed uh, these things into their report, you know, they should be ensued. But uh, I found out from, from a conference that a press release from an oil company, they can never be sued for if they say not telling the truth. So I mean, again, press releases, uh, you should be very careful when you get them from the industry because uh, they can say whatever they like and they don't need to uh, be responsible for it. But uh, what do you think about a story like this? Uh, is that something that should also be discussed? How mis uh, say con uh, press release uh, pushed forward by journalists uh, will mislead everything up to the president? You know? Maybe we can, the point is that the, the industry has a lot of money and puts a lot of effort into trying to influence journalists. Maybe you can comment on how much of that you get and then what would be helpful to journalists as a counter to that. So people in this room, what can they do? Maybe we can, since we're wrapping up, we can end on some very practical advice on what people who want to challenge the industry's propaganda. Um, the the uh, slogan, or bannered across our Washington website is speak truth to power. And uh, that's what we set out to do uh, in, in our investigative reporting. Um, and um, it's, it's hard work and it requires um, facts which, which are constantly challenged or spun uh, by um, usually the side that you're looking at pretty hard. And that's when I think basically one step that I'll throw to, to this group, which, is, which has some, I know some very bright minds uh, here, is gather the facts and, and have them ready and certainly don't be shy about offering them to journalists. Uh, I'm, I'm always happy to get to whatever information I can, especially if it helps me come up with a way to debunk uh, some significant uh, statement or position by industry or government. One of, uh, one of the, the great uh, reporters for Hearst Newspapers, a guy named Eric Nalder, and, and he's won a number, number of Pulitzer Prizes, and, and he always uh, says that the most important question a reporter can ask of a source is how do you know that? And the second most important question is who else do you know who knows that? Um, and, and I think that's really, really important. When we're calling you, yes, we're looking for quotes, yes, we're looking for information, but we're also looking for facts. And, and one of the things that I've found with, with some of the folks in this room that I've spoken with uh, in the past is you guys have a lot of facts at your disposal. And if you can send me data, if you can send me charts, uh, if you can send me things that are, that are objective uh, in their nature, then, then it enhances my credibility as, as well as your own. And so that's, that's really what I'm looking for. I think we're all very focused on the fact that oil companies uh, tend to, to put their own views, their own spin in press releases. I, I will say, um, actually, I remember the day they, they made the Jack announcement because we had a big discussion as to how we should play it. And, and I'm not ultimately the decider of that, so I don't, I don't remember how it came out. But I remember saying at the time, uh, you know, a lot of times they hype these big discoveries and they don't pan out. Um, you know, I think we have to be very careful about that, although I will also say that part of our responsibility as journalists is to cover the daily story, which is Chevron is saying this. Uh, it does have an impact on their shareholders. Um, and, and so there is a news story there. Their stock price is going to respond to that. There is a short-term story to be done there, but there's also a longer-term story, which is that, that perspective and that context. And that's, that's what our real challenge in the media is going forward, is, is how to get that, that in there as well. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to cut it off. I'm going to... I know, but I'm going to say some things. Oh, okay. this is, I got the mic, buddy, okay? This is UT. 
Now, I just want to try and wrap up, and because there's some themes that come out that I'd, I'd like to, to identify. One is the recognition that these issues are interconnected, that we do get often very specialized, we develop an expertise, but it's always very important, I think, to connect the, the social and the ecological, the political and the scientific. All of this is part of the same set of problems. I'm originally from the state of North Dakota, and I feel this a lot because I'm watching the western part of my home state being torn apart by this hydraulic fracturing, which is having really severe consequences for the people uh, as we're ripping up that part of the state. So trying to remember to make those connections, which means thinking about basic systems, including the political and the economic systems, being willing to challenge capitalism and the current way we elect leaders, for instance. Uh, the other thing, excuse me, I wanted to say was uh, about the, the point I made at the beginning, about the difference between journalists, individuals trying to do their job, and journalism as a, an institution. And to remember that I think there are really often two levels at which we're trying to work. Uh, and, and an analogy here would be to the political system. We know that big money dominates contemporary American politics. We also know that at this moment we have to play the political game that's in front of us. And so there's a kind of two-pronged strategy. One is to try and work with the system as it exists, trying to influence legislators under the rules of the game that exist, but also for many people trying to shift the way we, for instance, fund elections, a longer term strategy about campaign financing. And I would counsel the same sort of strategy with media. On the one hand, we have to play the game as it exists today, which often means looking for the individual frontline reporters and editors who do want to do good work. And we have two great examples on stage right here. And not asking how can I vent my anger on them, but how can I help them? And there's been some good suggestions. The other is realizing there is a fundamental problem with the design of the media system in the United States, a corporate, commercial, advertising-funded media system. And trying to work to shift that is also, I think, part of the project. So my last job, then, is to thank Greg Gordon and Lauren Steffi for a really, I thought, insightful and interesting comments. So thank you very much for being here and uh, to look to Jan to see if there's any announcements before break. Perfect.